gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus walked along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. The disciple asked Jesus, Rabbi, who this sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of God who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When Jesus had said this, Jesus spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the one called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. And the Pharisees also began to ask him, how he had received his sight, he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man said, He is. The people did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. For himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the religious leaders, for they had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind. And they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples. Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but God does listen to one who worships God and obeys God's will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sin, and you are trying to teach us. And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when Jesus found him, Jesus said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe.
believe and he worshiped him jesus said i came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind some of the pharisees near jesus heard this and said surely we are not blind are we jesus said to them if you were blind you would not have sin but now that you say we see your sin remains the gospel of the lord praise to you O christ one of the offerings that we've had during lent is our children leading us in a time where they have given to adults post-its and we've been writing prayers and so today for our um, children's time i'm going to imagine that i am a child and um, one of the adults working with the children and what we are offering today and had offered in the sanctuary is something called a noticing wall a noticing wall is something that you can put up on a refrigerator or on a wall actually ed and i are using in the parsonage a notebook on things that we're noticing during this time but we're asking that what you offer and excuse me for i have slippery ears here Whatever you are noticing during this time, we invite you um, to track that during the days of this week. And the prompting question that we offer for today is notice what you are saying to God and notice how you feel those two things. So we thank God for the gift of children who help us to bring the incarnation of God's love to life in this very concrete way. This season. Let us pray. Holy God, we give thanks for this day and for this time. And as we receive your word, we ask that through the power of your Holy Spirit, that somehow, even though at a distance, you bring real connection. We are trusting that your love is not just stronger than we imagine, but more than we imagine. And for that, we give thanks. So today, as we are gathering in different places and, and trusting in God's provision to gather us, as we are in this season of Lent, we also have the commemoration of Archbishop or Monsignor, now Saint Oscar Romero. It is a commemoration that we have been doing for the last several years in different forms. And so we give thanks that this is an opportunity that we have today for our time of sermon and our time of worship. We are also, through Lent, have been using a book by Barbara Brown Taylor entitled Learning to Walk in the Dark. And as we um, have moved into a time in our world where the pandemic is extensive, where the fears are real, where people are dying, we also sense that this time is beyond anything that as a globe we've experienced before and just to confirm that God has been leading us through the Holy Spirit and giving us this topic in advance we thank Jeff Jackson Droney for having a few conversations with the pastor about using this book um, I did hear on the radio um, that is often on in the parsonage if you know us it's usually on in the parsonage and one of the commentators in talking about the pandemic saying in this we are walking in the dark and so one of the sections of the book that um, justin and i shared on wednesday night in lent talks about barbara brown taylor's um, sort of delineating and sort of sorting out in the areas of talking about um, faith being something that translates life translates our suffering and that that is super valid now. It helps us um, perhaps to make it through the day. And though she says that also faith has a transformational quality to it that can exist. And she offers that that though happens when we go to the place which is the hole or the pit. Or I think of that in the 23rd Psalm in the valley of the shadow of death. In those places, she says, what you find, there's nothing that can fill you up 
It's not like it's a fast food filling that allows you to be trusting in God at that point. She said, instead, it's a transformation that allows you to be in the suffering and to discover that God is there. And so we are going to talk a little bit about that today because we have a transformational experience in this long gospel story. We have um, someone who has been born blind, so their entire life has been one of what other people would call darkness, but the person who's been born blind, they are used to it. And to them, it is light. And that space, perhaps, of what we would call darkness becomes this incredible prime for a person who has not met Jesus before who Jesus just sees on the side of the road in one of his many travels, this space of darkness that the man has every moment of every day becomes a prime for meeting Jesus. And meeting Jesus in a particular way that does give the miracle of seeing and it gives the transformational experience of encountering Jesus and of becoming one of Jesus' disciples. I read the scripture now a few times, and it is very long, and every time, well, not every time, multiple times I come across the word mud, and I'm like, one mud, and then read it again, I'm like, no, there are two muds, and then read it again, no, three muds. There are four muds in this story. It is so physical what Jesus does when he meets this man. He takes some earth, he spits in it, he makes mud, and then he puts the mud on the man's eyes. That way of Jesus touching and engaging is so incarnational and so clear of how the gift of good touch allows both sight to happen, and then through the gift of Jesus encountering this man with mud, and then the unpacking of what had happened and who Jesus is, notice it takes a little while for this person who now can see to call themselves a disciple, and they do. And so this transformational experience of encountering Jesus also is clear in the life of Oscar Romero, who was born in El Salvador in the early 1900s and became a priest. And by the 1970s, that country was in deep turmoil, where the military was violently killing the poor people, the peasants, called the campesinos. And at that point in time, the church, which was the Roman Catholic Church, was complicit with the government, complicit in that it ignored it, and it just made it sort of be like, actually, we're just gonna take the neutral place here and not say anything. And when it came for the election of the archbishop, and it became evident that what the body wanted was someone that would um, offer, excuse me, someone that would offer a, a neutrality during that time. It was Oscar Romero who was elected. He was elected because he was known as um, a scholar, someone who wouldn't get their hands dirty with the regular people, someone who knew some of the priests who were working with the campesinos, like his friend, Brother Grande, but would not take up the measure of solidarity that Brother Grande and his cohort had. And so Romero was elected and was seen as the safe candidate who stayed in that place of distance, both emotional, physical, and spiritual distance. And that was maintained until the day that Romero heard that his brother, his friend, Brother Grande, had been murdered killed by the military, and the story is of Romero going to that place, and in addition to the body of his dear friend, the campesinos, the peasants, are lined up dead on the ground, and that Romero touches that very body of his friend and touches the blood on his friend's body, and that becomes a transformational experience where in that hole of sheer crucifixion, sheer cross, Romero meets Christ in the 
dead body of his friend and in the dead bodies of all the peasants around him. And Romero is not the same. He has been transformed to become what we read earlier, that he becomes a prophet for God in that time and in that place. And it is through the dead bodies that he picks up over and over again, physically, incarnationally, and metaphorically, that he becomes aware of a love of God and a depth and a breadth and a kind of faith that begins to get him in trouble because he calls down the military. He knows where the injustice is and he calls them out. And from that, he gains all manner of death threats. And one of the quotes from him, as time goes on, and he says, I have received death threats, and probably I will die. And I also know that when I die, I will rise up in the lives of the Salvadoran people. That dying and rising, that classic and orthodox mystery of Christ, that the dying on the cross is not the end of the story. It's the rising from the dead that happens. Romero trusts and has faith in that and he is killed one time in a way that is so graphic about how what is evil does go after what is good. And Romero is at the table celebrating his communion, that mystery of God's love that cannot be stopped. And someone comes in the back of the chapel and guns him down, and he dies before the communion. His own blood is there before the community. And so rising up in the Salvadoran people is not a one-time way that God works. Romero is not the only prophet. We are in a time when we are invited to have that translation of our suffering through our faith and to trust that transformational experiences actually are around us and before us. We need community to be able to trust that because it's so easy to imagine that God has abandoned us all in our isolation from each other, in our distancing from each other. It may seem as if the connections are impossible to make. Yet we have this promise lived out in that 23rd Psalm we have this promise that is made real in the life of this person, born blind in the Gospel of John, made real in the life and death of Romero, made real in our life and in the people who are dying even around us today. May you find comfort in this, and may you take time to notice both the suffering that is real, notice what is being revealed about the injustice of the systems, here in this nation, 